Okay, good morning. Oh, hello, hello. Can you hear me? Hello. Sorry. Can I get some volume? Good morning and welcome to the bridge. There we go. How's everybody feeling? It's a beautiful day. Um, okay. I just want to start out, first of all, uh, last week we brought Leland up to pray for him. i uh, just give you guys a quick update on that if you don't get the prayer request uh, or prayer update email. Uh, Leland is here today uh, wearing a super fly hat and jacket, looking super swag. So he's doing great. Um, couldn't have asked for a better result. And so that's just an answer to prayer request there. Um, so we could give God the glory for that. Uh, and so as we uh, go into worship today, um, you know, we just came off a weekend where the Super Bowl had happened, uh, and one of my favorite parts about the Super Bowl experience is the media day. And as a lot of you probably know, uh, one of the most famous guys on media, media day is Marshawn Lynch. Um, and if you watched any of it, he sat there during his interview, and all he said to every reporter question was, I'm just here so I don't get fined. I don't know if you guys saw that or heard about it, but every question, he probably, he's required to sit there for five minutes. He probably said it 25 times. I'm just here so I don't get fined. And this does make sense, I hope. As we move into worship, uh, my prayer is that you guys aren't sitting here today so that you don't get fined. <laughs> I mean, I'm being serious because a lot of times, uh, as we see in the scripture uh, later on, the Israelites did just that thing. They showed up to church. They did the Bible studies. They did all those things, but simply so that they wouldn't get fined. And my prayer is that you're here to meet with God today, not so that you don't have to face the consequence. And so as we move into worship, let's just focus on the fact that we're here to worship, not here to just pay respect. All right. Well, good morning. If you'll go ahead and stand, we're going to worship together this morning. We're going to start with blessed be your name. So in a land that is plentiful, when things are good, when things are bad, as believers, we have the privilege of singing blessed be your name because you're good. So let's sing this together this morning. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your streams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place. Though I walk through the wilderness, blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. And when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Sun shining down on me when the world's all that it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering. Though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. With every blessing and every blessing you pour out on. Turn back to praise, and when the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name, you give and take away, you give and take away. Give and take away. 
Amen. Lift it up to him this morning. Amen. 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 Psalm, Psalm 121, 1 and 2 says, I lift my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Um, we have the God who created the universe on our side. Um, and he loves us and he draws near to us, but he is the God of the universe. And so we have nothing to fear. And so we're gonna see about that now. Whom shall I fear? You hear me when I call, you are my morning song. Though darkness fills the night, it cannot hide the light. Whom shall I fear? You crush the enemy underneath my feet. You are my sword and shield, though troubles linger still. Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. My strength is in your name, for you alone can save. You will deliver me, yours is the victory. Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side, and nothing formed against me shall stand. You hold the whole world in your hand. I'm holding on to your promises. You are faithful. You are faithful. You are faithful. I know who goes before me. I know who stands behind. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever. He is a friend of mine. The God of angel armies is always by my side. The God of angel armies is always by my side. Amen. 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 Uh, so we serve a powerful God, a good God, a mighty God, a just God. Uh, but he sent his son to die for us so that we could have a personal relationship with him. We're going to think about that now. Um, Romans 5, 6 through 8 says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly, or for us. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But, and I love the buts in the Bible, that but, which sounds kind of weird, I'm sorry. Um, 
but those there's always all of these but God right in the Bible um, all of these things were the case but God did this and so the last part of this verse is but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners Christ died for us so let's sing praises to him for that now When I survey the wondrous cross On which the Prince of Glory died My richest gain I count but loss And poor contempt on Bids me come and die And find that I may truly live Oh, the wonderful cross Oh, the wonderful cross All who gather here By grace draw near And bless your name See from his head his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet? Or thorns come have uh, children uh, who are newborn through fifth grade. It's time for them to head back to Children's Church. As they head back, we're going to go ahead and pray for them um, and just pray that uh, the Lord will continue to lead us in worship this morning. Let's pray. Father, you are so, 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 so good. Um, thank you for the gift of your church. Thank you for the gift of family and you, brothers and sisters and you. Thank you for the people who are sitting in these pews this morning. Thank you for the people who I'm worshiping with on stage this morning, Father. Thank you that we come to you united. Um, I thank you, um, Father, that you're a God who is a perfect combination of mercy and justice, who sent your Son 
because of your mercy and because of your justice, Father. I pray that these kids, as they head back to Children's Church this morning, Father, that they would see that, that they would see you, that they would realize, even as kids, Father, just their need for you. I pray that as we continue to worship you this morning, that you would show us our need for you, that you would show us um, our weaknesses and our failures and our sin. Father, that you would make it clear uh, where we need you, because we do need you. And we just acknowledge that this morning. And as we continue in worship, Father, um, may your great name be praised. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Psalm 99, 3 through 5 says, Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The king in his might loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. And we're going to tell him how holy he is right now with your great name. Your great name, all condemned, feel no shame at the sound of your great name. Every fear has no place at the sound of your great name. The enemy, he has to leave. Sound of your great name, Jesus. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and man, you are high and lifted up. That all the world will praise your great name. All the said amen let's go to the lord in prayer
Father, we, uh, we love you so much. You are the greatest Father anyone could ever have. With a love so abounding and so perfect that you never leave us. You're faithful to be with us. You're patient with us. And our times when we forget and we struggle, we thank you for those struggles because they bring us back to you. They bring us back to you to know the truth. And the truth is that you gave us your son, Jesus, so we can be with you. Because without him, we're not there. Your grace is enough. I thank you for everybody here. I thank you for the way that you uh, make us your children, your church. I want to pray for uh, Stephen, Lord. Speak boldly through him today so we may hear what it is you have to reveal to each and every single one of us. And Lord, I ask that you just perform that miracle in our hearts. Mm -hmm. So we may continue to walk out of here day after day with joy in our hearts, knowing that you love us and you are our God. We love you. We trust you. And oh, do we need you. Pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Those words to that last song that we sang, the lost are saved. They find their way at the sound of your great name. And I just want to uh, begin today by the reminder that we're going to be only in the life of Moses for a few more weeks, and we're going to open Bibles to Numbers chapter 21 today and look at the first nine verses of that chapter. If you remember, the Israelites are on a journey, and they are headed to the Promised Land, and along this journey, they have had mostly bad behavior and occasionally little glimpses of good behavior. And in this particular uh, section, we're going to see the Israelites doing pretty well for about three verses and the Israelites doing not so well for about five verses. I was thinking about that, I'm like, you know, wow, that's, that's kind of like me. <laughs> By God's grace, I can do really well for about three verses, and there's about five verses that I just totally blow it, and in the midst of blowing it, God's love doesn't change. Because of Jesus, those that are in him, there's this profound, mind-boggling thought that there is nothing that I can do to make God in Christ love me any more than he does today. And there is nothing that I can make God do in Christ that, makes me love, that, that will make him love me any less. That because of Christ, he loves me perfectly on my good days, and on my bad days. Because he's not judging, thank God, my works and my merits. He is judging me on the basis of his one and only son, Jesus, who was perfect. So, where we have performance and we have things that we live out in this Christian life, and there are definitely curses connected to disobedience and blessings connected to obedience. God loves his son perfectly. And if you are in his son today, he loves you perfectly. Not every single one of these Israelites are trusting in the provision and the sacrifice of the son. There's a good chance that not every single one of you are trusting in the provision and the sacrifice of Christ. There's a good chance that some of you trust some days, you know, those three verse days where you're trusting radically in Christ, 
and then those five verse days where you're like, well, I, well, of course I'm a Christian, but this and this and this and this and this and this needs to happen in order for me to have peace and in order for my life to go well. Let this time be a moment when God takes you and lifts your head to the Son, the author and finisher of our faith. Numbers 21, beginning with verse 1. This is God's word to us. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by the way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. And Israel vowed a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. And the Lord obeyed the voice of Israel and gave over the Canaanites, and they devoted them and their cities to destruction. So the name of the place was called Horma. From Mount Hor, they set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient on the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten, when he sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. Please pray with me. Father, may you fill your people with your spirit. And may you remind us that this is your word. And may it go down deep into our hearts. May you use me simply as an instrument of your voice so that each person who is here today may say with confidence, we heard God speak today. We pray this for your glory and in your name, Jesus. Amen. If you remember from last week, Moses was being nice and he decided to ask for permission instead of ask for forgiveness. And he asked the people of Edom, hey, can we just use your road to travel through because it's kind of a shortcut on where we're going? And the Edomites said, no, or you will meet our army. And Moses then has to take the people the long way around. And along the long way around, we meet these people called the Canaanites. The king of Arad, which I don't know a ton about other than we can get this from scripture. Israel seems to be minding their own business, walking, headed to where they're supposed to go, and all of a sudden, this Canaanite king gathers the Canaanite army and attacks. This attack is initiated by the Canaanites, not the Israelites. And some of the Israelites are captured and taken prisoner. Now, we've learned that there's 600,000 men plus women and children in the Israelite army. There probably weren't that many Israelites that got captured. Israel could have looked at this situation and said, you know what? Only a few of us got captured. 
not a big deal. We want to get away from Canaan as fast as we can, so we're going to move on and sorry about those that got captured. But we need to move on. They didn't do that. The other thing that they did not do, that they could have done, that you maybe have done and I have done from time to time, is we could have said, well, how dare they go after some of our own? We are going to get them back. Forget to talk to the Lord about it. That you try to do the right thing in your own strength, by your own power, apart from trusting in God and his power. Canaanites have some of these Israelites prisoners. Now, I shared this with my community group already, and I just, here's the disclaimer, everybody, okay? You can't believe everything you read on the internet. But, when an article that you read on the internet works to prove a point, <laughs> it's helpful. So I want to say, I don't know if this is true, because my whole life, and in every single class that I've taught at the school I teach at, I have always communicated to people that sheep are dumb. But my son is crazy about animals, and around Christmas time, he wants to learn something about animals, and he already knows more animals at seven years old than I do. So I go to my rusty, trusty phone and do a Google search that says the, the 25 smartest animals. And guess what? The sheep made the top 25 list of the smartest animals. I go, oh man, I've got to like go and retract everything that I've said about sheep being dumb because apparently they're one of the top 25 smartest animals. But each animal had a little paragraph written about why that animal was smart. The two reasons, and I knew one of these two, about sheep is that sheep are able to recognize the voice of their shepherd. And number two, sheep are profoundly aware when one of them is missing from the flock. They're aware of that. Now we have all of these connections of Jesus saying, I am the good shepherd. You are the sheep. My sheep hear my voice and they come in. But the other responsibility that we have as believers who seek to walk with the shepherd is not only be able to recognize his voice, but to be aware when some from our flock are missing. Israel is aware in this situation, as this attack has been given, that some from their flock, some from their people are missing. And it bothers them. They don't just say, oh well, you know, if they would have been walking on this side of the road instead of this side of the road, this wouldn't have happened to them. And we do that sometimes, right? When someone drifts away, when someone's love for God begins to grow cold, and we see certain actions that they're committing leading to, to sin and, and destruction, and I think sometimes we do this because we know if we really got real about it, it would really hurt, and we don't like to hurt. But then we just kind of say, oh, well, you know, I mean, that's just how they are. Israel goes to God about those who are captured and says to God, if you will indeed give this people into my hand, then I will devote their cities to destruction. Now, I understand there's some complications with that, right? We have like, thou shalt not murder. And now the Israelites are saying, hey God, we gotta, we're going to vow a vow to you here. You give these people over to us and we will devote their entire cities to destruction. And it should cause some of us to scratch our head and go, what in the... What in the world? Like, well, what is this? This is probably why some people think that the God of the Old Testament is a God of wrath and anger. Have you heard that before? And the God of the New Testament is a God of, of love and, and mercy. Well, let's play this out a little bit here. 
Doesn't a good, loving father wage war against those things that attack his children? I'll never forget, just graduated from high school, or sorry, from college, and because I, and, I was at a high school football game, and I met someone that was the dad of a girl that I used to coach on swim team. And this dad had an older son, and he shared with me that his older son had gotten into a lot of drugs and a lot of crime and a lot of problems. And he said, you know, there was a time where my wife and I just said, well, you know, he's just being experimental. He's going to get over this. This isn't going to be that big of a deal. And then it escalated and it got worse and it got worse and it got worse. And I realized I can turn a blind eye and kind of be a cool dad and he'll get along with me. Or I can wage war against the thing that is destroying my son. And my son may hate me for the rest of my life, his life, but if it saves his life, it is worth it. And he said that in tears. This is God, a loving father, and a people of God saying, some of our own are captured. Far be it to us if we sit idly by and don't wage war against what's capturing them. Now, beautiful thing is, in the New Testament, we can look at Ephesians chapter 6, and Paul is very clear. He tells us that our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Sometimes it may feel that way. You get a, another person that just drives you nuts and you just want to go to war against that person. But Paul says, our struggle is against spiritual forces of darkness. We have an enemy and then often we are our own worst enemy. Okay? Sometimes when we say we have an enemy, we say, oh, well, good then. I can point the finger. The devil made me do it. I don't think the devil makes us do anything. He can be convincing with his lies. But most of the time, and James chapter 1 tells us, that we are often captured when we ourselves cave in to a temptation. So whether it's Satan or whether it's us or a combination thereof, when we are duped into believing lies. We need to devote those lies to destruction. And perhaps it might be beneficial for you just to take a quick moment and say to God, ask God, what lies am I believing right now? What lies have I been duped into thinking are true that really are not true at all? And can I devote those lies and those false things that aren't true, can I devote them to destruction? My college roommate uh, played a lot of video games and I got seasick after Nintendo 64 came out with that James Bond thing. So I'm not a video game guy. I couldn't figure it out. But he played a lot of video games. And we talked about sin one day. And, and he said, you know what I do? He had this Star Wars one where he was in this like fighter pilot and He's flying through, this is going somewhere, I promise. And, and there's all these enemy attack ships going. And I said, this is what I kind of feel like God's done. God has basically put me in this like starship fighter and he's given me the trigger. And he's given me power to as, as lies and sin and the enemy comes my way. I can get it into focus and I can pull the trigger and I can devote that thing to destruction before it takes a foothold in me. And I just need to be intentional about making sure that I say, okay, God, help me see sin for sin. Help me see lies for lies and give me power and courage to pull the trigger before it digs down deep inside me. So Israel says, God, we need you to deliver this people into our hands, okay? When we try to go and attack sin and attack evil and bring brothers and sisters back, and we do that 
apart from saying, God, it's got to be you. It's like trying to put out a blazing fire with a water gun. It isn't going to get very far. But God, with one breath, can put out things. And he does, and he did for them here. What's interesting is we don't get to read about the reunion. Let's think about these Israelites that were captured. I mean, these Israelites were fathers, and and they were sons, and and they got back, and there should have been this grand reunion, and there should have been all this praise to God, right? There's this wonderful victory here. If you read verse 4, it's like there's no mention of that. It says that they head out again after this victory and they go around and it says the people became impatient on the way. This is the people becoming impatient right after God gives them a victory. I'm sure you've never done anything like that before. I can remember sometimes praying that God would help me do well on a test and God would come through and I would do well on the test, and I would get the grade, and I would walk away going, boy, it sure is a good thing I'm smart. And I don't know what might have happened for Israel once they do get these people back, and they're protected, but pride is a funny thing that rears its ugly head so many times. And God wants us to live in constant daily dependence on Him. So how do you know whether you're depending on God or not? One who depends on God, you're ready, I'm going to step on your toes, is one who is patient. Failure to depend on God leads to impatience, which is what the people are doing here. One who depends on God says, God, I don't understand everything that I'm going through in my life right now, but I know that you are going to do the perfect thing at the perfect time and the perfect way, and I'm going to trust you when I am so doggone tempted to be impatient and argue and complain. I'm going to trust you. Impatience... uh escalates into other things too, doesn't it? Now the people begin to speak against God and against Moses. They speak against the very one that just gave them victory. And they say, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? What are they saying here? God does not have a good plan for us. God, if this is your plan, this is a plan that, for destruction, not for goodness. Someone said one time that what comes to your mind when you think about God, I think it was Tozer, matters more immensely than anything else you can ever think about. If you believe that God is good and has your goodness in mind and in heart, then you're good. And God's good. And you're able to have strength. But if you think God is out to get you, it's going to mess up your relationship with him. They go on to complain about temporary things. There is no food and no water. We'll stop there for a second. No food and no water are significant issues, right? Right? But then he goes on and says, and we loathe this worthless food. I go, wait, he just said there was no food, and now he says, we don't like this worthless food. I'm sure none of us have ever been in the kitchen of our home and looked and said, there is nothing in this house to eat at all. When in reality, every single cabinet is full. Just not what we want. Not what we like. There's a video that circulated about a a year, year and a half ago that was called First World Problems. If you have not seen that, I'd like to encourage you to YouTube it after the service. Don't YouTube it now, okay? 
First world problems is an incredible perspective of a reminder of, really, we have it much better than we think we do. So I asked uh, Nick earlier in the week what jumped out at him about this passage, and he came back and said something like, uh, those who have no reason to cry will soon have a reason to cry if they cry. It's interesting that sometimes when we think our lives are so bad, and then something really bad happens, it can change our perspective. Right after this complaining in verse 6, with no advance notice, we hear, and then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people. A lot of us would feel a lot more comfortable if that word sent was actually the word allow. The, the Lord allowed fiery serpents among the people. The Lord sent seems to almost be this sense in which every animal is God speaks to them and they listen and God's snakes go. How would God send fiery serpents among the people to bite the people and some of the people of Israel die and they quit thinking about no food and they quit thinking about no water at this point because now there's this infested fiery snakes just all over the place if you like Indiana Jones it's a scene in Indiana Jones in the Last Crusade where a young Indiana Jones is running on a train and he falls through and he lands in this huge bucket of snakes. And snakes are creepy. And I don't know very many people that are brave around snakes. And it's scary. Could it be that fear can cause us to run to God? Could it be that some things that life throws us can cause us to love God and depend on God and trust in God more. I've shared this before, but my son broke his arm on a trampoline. We even had a safety net, but those safety nets only work if you remember to zip them. And he fell through the safety net and broke his arm. Nobody wants to see that happen to their kid, but there was this incredible blessing in disguise that took place. Before my son broke his arm, when he skinned his knee, he cried like he lost his leg. Okay, it was like this traumatic, like, like dude, you just fell down. It's okay, you're gonna be all right. He didn't think he was until he broke his arm and experienced a new level of pain and discomfort and at that point he still after that would fall down and scrape his knee but he just kind of look and go yeah it's not broken I'm okay and off he goes okay and it's interesting that so many times when we go through difficult things in life those difficult things give us an appropriate perspective that what we used to complain about isn't really that big of a deal. The other thing that happens is the people come to Moses. They go to the one that they spoke against. This could not be fun for Israel, right? When you're really mad at someone and you're speaking against someone and then you have to go to that person and kind of like own up to something that you did, it's not always fun. But it's very healthy. What do they say? We have sinned. Erica talked about all of the, the, the but gods in the Bible and those are awesome. But there are other buts that are excuses, right? And here in this passage, 
we don't see Israel excuse their sin. Say, we have sinned. No, but if there was just better food, we would have been okay. No, but if we just could have gone the shortcut, we wouldn't have behaved this way. It's just, we have sinned. Then they get specific. We have spoken against the Lord and against you. I was in Minneapolis earlier this week at a pastor's conference. And Minneapolis is a really cool city that has these skywalk things. Anybody ever been to Minneapolis? And skywalks are like on the second level above all of the roads. And it was like three degrees outside. So these skywalks mean you don't have to go outside and freeze to death. That was probably too dramatic. But it's really cold. And these skywalks are really, really cool. Except... I used a skywalk that was supposed to get me where I needed to go in five minutes. And 30 minutes later, I am still walking around in these mazes of skywalks with no idea where I'm supposed to go. So they all start looking the same after a while. I, I think I passed four subways in these skywalks. And I was looking for food, but I'm like, no, I can get Subway back at home. I want to go somewhere else. It took forever. I found a map on the skywalk, and I'm like, okay, this will help me. And my problem is, I don't really read maps very well. When GPS was invented, that was really good for me. The step-by-step -step thing, except that lady could probably tell us a little sooner. Um... I'm really out in left field right now, aren't I? Anyway, usually on those maps, they have this little sticker that says, you are here. And if this map had that sticker after three minutes of staring at it, I couldn't find it. So I had no idea how to get where I wanted to go because I didn't know where I was. There are so many of us that have no idea where we need to go because we do not know where we are. There is so much in culture and society that tells us, well, as long as you're not Hitler or Stalin and you're a pretty friendly neighbor and you don't cheat too much on your taxes, you're okay. You're not okay. There are a lot of people that say, well, you know, I mean, as long as you've like mastered six or seven of those Ten Commandments, God's going to grade on the curve and you'll get in. You'll be okay. You are not okay. And at this point, Moses hears the people of Israel understand clearly where they are. They were thinking before, well, I just need food, and I just want different food, and I want water, and I don't like the shortcut. And they felt like somehow they had some right to God's good fortune. And you and I do not have any rights to God's goodness. And the only way that you and I will be received by God is to acknowledge I have sinned against you, Lord. I have sinned against you. No excuses. No creative ways to wiggle out of it. I have sinned. I need help. Please come and help me. That's what they did. They go to Moses. And they cry out for help. It was a pretty dire situation for them. Snakes are slithering around, and their friends and family are getting bitten, and some of them are dying. It's very much up close and personal 
the danger that's there. The danger is not always so up close and personal in the here and now. But that doesn't necessarily make it any less dangerous. Sin will destroy us and keep us from God. But it is also interesting what Israel prays. Ask the Lord, pray to the Lord that he would take away the snakes, serpents. I think that's a pretty good prayer. When I'm in the midst of pain and difficulty and tough things, what do I want? I want whatever's causing that pain, I want it to go away. The interesting thing is, Moses does not pray that way. Moses just simply prays for the people. I believe in praying specifically, but as we pray specifically, we need to always be aware of the fact that when we think that what we pray for is God's will, we need to be very careful. We do not always know God's will in every single circumstance and situation. What we do know is God's will is that people have prayer cover. So Moses does not actually pray, God, take these snakes away. Moses just prays for the people. And what happens? God tells Moses to put a snake, a bronze snake, on a pole. And anyone that is bitten can look to that snake and live. Moses does that. And if a serpent bit anyone, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. It's not very hard to look. You can't earn salvation. Salvation is a look. Tim Keller said that Christianity is the most inclusive, exclusive faith that there is. Now let me unpack that for a second. Notice that God told Moses to tell the people to look to the bronze snake. And everyone, inclusive, everyone who looks to that snake will live. But only those who look to that snake live. I pitched this to my wife the other day. And she very quickly said, I don't know that that would have been the case in Israel at that time. And she's right. Wives are usually right, right? But one thing that, that she said is, because I said, you know what would have been really interesting? Just a scenario here. What if somebody got bit by a snake and they know that that bronze snake is available and they have heard Moses say, if you look to that bronze snake, you'll live. But they get bit, and they're kind of macho tough. And they go, ooh, yeah, that's a little fiery, but I've got this. I'm going to go, and I'm going to drink a little bit of V8, and I'm going to eat a banana, and I'm going to lay down for 30 minutes, and I'm going to get up, and I'm going to be okay. I can save myself. There might have been someone else in that crowd that day who got bit by a snake, and said, yeah, I know that bronze snake thing, that's available to look at. And some people think if you look at that, you live. But I'm a little more open-minded. I feel like as long as I believe sincerely with all of my heart, I can look to the sunset and look there for cure to this poison of the snake. And I will be okay. Because after all, aren't there many roads that lead to God after all? As long as we believe sincerely in our hearts. My wife told me that would not have been going on 
in that desert because there were snakes all over the place. And people had visibly seen people die from the snake bites. So at that point, the desperation is such that they know they've got one solution, one cure, one hope, one salvation, and they would look to that bronze snake. As I prayed leading up to this message, one prayer that I prayed is that you and I here this morning would recognize that our situation today is no less desperate and dangerous than the situation for Israel when the snakes are slithering around all over the place. And that we would not be those who think that we can save ourselves and that we would not be those who believe that we can look any which way and be saved as long as we really, really, really believe it. But that we would recognize that there has been one provision for our salvation. Jesus picks this up in John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. He's talking to a man named Nicodemus. Nicodemus was the teacher of the law at that time. But Nicodemus was totally clueless on how you get to know God in a personal way. And Jesus tells him in verse 14, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Most amazing thing about this is God tells Moses to put a snake on a pole. You can think of a hundred different animals that would be better than a snake. Plus, the snake is the very thing that's biting them. They're going to look to the thing that bites them in order to be saved? Yeah, kind of. You and I have to look to our sin in order to be saved. We look to our sin in order to see our Savior. Because after staring at our sin, we realize our only hope is a Savior. So the Israelites look to a snake on a pole. It's better for us in the New Testament. You know what we look at? We look at our Savior on our cross. On, on our cross. He is on our cross. Taking our place. Jesus died. So we didn't have to. And we look to him and we will live. So, people of the bridge, look to Jesus and live. You have been bitten, but there is a cure. There is a salvation. Look to Jesus and live. Let's pray. Father, our eyes wander and our sin uh, distances us from you. But may we be those today who by your grace center our eyes on your Son and as we look to him, may we live Lord, I pray that there are those here today that look and are forever changed. I pray that there are those here today that realize my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus, His blood, and His righteousness. So that we may stand on the solid rock looking to Jesus and living for you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Before we sing this final song, which is called Cornerstone, I want you guys just to kind of have a little bit of time 
for quiet reflection and prayer. They made us do this at the pastor's conference. And uh, I realized after I did it, I don't do that very often. You know what else happened when I did that? I heard God. And it dawned on me, man, my busyness, my constant need to go, 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 go. I'm forfeiting an opportunity to hear from the only one I really need to hear from. So as there's a little bit of music just quietly playing. I want you to pause and ask God, God, would you speak to me as I seek to look to your son and live? Would you speak? He will. He loves to speak to his people. We just continue in a spirit of reflection. Um, if you know Jesus this morning, then we have an opportunity to come out of that reflection on our weakness and on our sin and on our failure to a place of joy because he has overcome. Uh, and we love to sing as a church that he is our cornerstone. He's who we build our foundation upon. Uh, if you don't know Jesus this morning, if he isn't your cornerstone, grab one of us after church, grab Stephen after church, and talk to him about that, um, because we want you to be able to sing with us, full of joy and full of hope and full of peace, um, that he is your cornerstone as well. So go ahead and stand, and we're going to sing together uh, that our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Let's sing this and close out. Holy trust in Jesus' name. Let's, Let's sing, sing that, that again. again. My hope is built. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Seems to hide. 
up to him. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, he is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, trust in his righteousness alone. Faultless I stand before the throne. Christ alone. Christ alone. Cornerstone. Weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord. Lord of all. Let's sing that one more time. Lift it up. Christ alone. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord. Lift up to him. You know, it's an amazing, amazing gift that we are saved by looking to the author and finisher of our faith. We are saved not by doing, but by looking. And the amazing thing is for those who have looked and God's indelible grace captures their hearts, they can't stop looking. And in the moments when they don't know where to go and maybe they've even tried for a little while to look over to the right or look over to the left, there's something that those who have looked to Jesus know only in him is their joy and peace and hope and strength and life. So I uh, talked to somebody else this week and they said, you know, so many people say, you got to acknowledge your sin, you got to acknowledge your sin, you got to acknowledge your sin. And I know that's true, but she said, for me, it was just knowing there's something more. Ecclesiastes says eternity has been put in our hearts to draw us to God. And His Spirit is the initiator of that action. And if He is drawing you today closer to Him, I just want to encourage you to share that with somebody before you go. Okay? To say, you know what? God did this today in me and I see him as beautiful. Maybe you saw him as beautiful walking in this morning. Awesome. Beauty doesn't get boring. Beauty just gets more and more amazing. And Christ is beautiful. So, I do have a couple short announcements. We have community groups all through the week. And then we have a men's uh, conference coming up called Iron Sharpens Iron. There's two opportunities for this. One is February 19th, sorry, 21st in O'Fallon, Illinois, and one is March 21st in Springfield, Illinois. And we'll be taking a group both to both of those. If one doesn't work, you can double dip and go to both. You don't have to. You don't have to go to either one. But we believe it's a worthwhile thing. And I uh, want to encourage you to do that, uh, take advantage of that. Um, and then uh, I just want to encourage you guys. Uh, I was up at this pastor's conference and there were a couple times, and I wasn't going to get emotional. Sorry, y'all are standing in here. I'm about to cry. But I am so grateful for the ways in which I see you guys uh, be gripped by God's grace. 
and the way in which you hunger after God. And uh, it is a joy to be partnering with you here for the gospel. So thank you for the ways you bless me. Amen. And on that note, we'll receive this benediction from Ephesians 3. Father, I pray that we may have power together with all the saints to grasp how high and wide and deep and long is the love of Christ so that we may know this love that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. May your love, Christ, fill us so that we may overflow and be salt and light to our community this week. So you would become more famous in our hearts, in our families, and in our community. Amen. Amen. There you go with God's grace and peace.